Greetings, everyone, and welcome to City Lights Live, the virtual extension of the City Lights events calendar. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis. This afternoon, we welcome to our virtual halls, Julie Farnham, in conversation with Robin Piguero. We are celebrating the publication of her new book, Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th inter insurrection and the future of right-wing extremism. It's published by our friends over at IG Books, which is a wonderful indie press. The launch of this book is, of course, timely. It is exactly three years ago to this day that Trump supporters stormed the Capitol and the nation experienced one of the most harrowing moments in its history. The events of that day continue to hold repercussions for us as we approach this year's presidential election. Domestic Darkness takes us inside the explosive events of January 6th from the viewpoint of a law enforcement insider who warned Capitol Police leadership in advance of the impending insurrection. Domestic Darkness also examines the specific groups behind the attack on the Capitol, their ideologies, and addresses the dangers to our upcoming elections and the impending threat to democracy. Before we begin, as is customary before each event, I'd like to acknowledge we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatishaloni peoples. We'd like to take a moment to pay respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Julie Farnham served as the Assistant Director of Intelligence for the United States Capitol Police prior to and during the January 6, 2021 insurrection. During her tenure, she oversaw the identification and vetting of nearly 20,000 threats against members of Congress, most of which were made by U.S. citizens who adhered to extremist ideologies. She drafted a report warning of the potential for violence on January 6th, Prior to joining the Capitol Police, Ms. Farnham served with the Department of Homeland Security for over 15 years. She holds a master's degree in intercultural relations from Lesley University, and she's the author of the book, U.S. Immigration Laws Under the Threat of Terrorism. She makes her home in Arlington, Virginia. And she's going to be joined today in conversation by Robin Piguero. Robin Piguero joined the historic select committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol as an investigative counsel leading interviews of witnesses from former cabinet secretaries to leadership within the Secret Service. Mr. Piguero co-led the summer hearings on President Trump's attempts at corrupting the Department of Justice and for his inaction during the attack, as well as the day's intelligence failures and delayed response by the National Guard. He is the author of the novel entitled With Prejudice. He also has a new novel coming out, which we kind of hope to feature very soon. Uh, more on that later. Uh, he serves as chief of staff to Congressperson Glenn Ivey. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be posting links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you will purchase copies of Domestic Darkness. Uh, also gonna be hosting a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please do post your questions and comments in that same chat function. So please join us now in welcoming Julie Farnham and Robin Piguero. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for your service. Most of all, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. All right, so Julie, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you, very nice to see you in these circumstances. Absolutely, so the last time I interviewed you, it was two years ago in December of 2021. We were sitting opposite one another with a court reporter in between us in the notoriously freezing January 6th committee interview room and it lasted a good three hours. So hopefully this will be a lot more of a comfortable setting for us both. But I was struck then by how candid and frank you were about the failings, some of which you concede were you were a part of, as well as the successes and foresight of yourself and your intelligence unit. For better or for worse, that openness appears to be your natural self, and you did not evade or dodge or duck tough questions like many, like maybe most in Capitol Police leadership did. And I know you're prepared to be as open and honest today as you were then, so thank you. You're Let welcome. Me, great. Let me begin by asking about your former boss, Stephen Sund, then chief of Capitol Police, who was fired the day after the insurrection. I read his book. I, of course, read your book. And as I write in my introduction to your book, you two are in many ways foils to one another. So my first question is, let me get your reaction to what he said about you in his book and in our deposition, the January 6th committee's deposition with him. First, he blames your preparedness or lack thereof on your quote, massive reorganizing of the intelligence unit, 
when they began shuffling analysts' responsibilities around, creating what analysts described as a lot of confusion within the unit. Second, he says that the last paragraph of your analysis, which famously did say that Congress is now the target, unlike the MAGA-1 and MAGA-2 marches of November and December, that it was, quote, always seemed odd to him and was, quote, peppered with qualifiers. He takes issue with the meaning of target, the word target, uh, which Webster literally defines as, quote, a mark to shoot at, saying it meant focus instead, and writing that, quote, people have read this paragraph and construed the term target to mean the target of some type of violence. But it is critical to understand that the target of every protest that occurs on Capitol Hill is Congress, he writes. And lastly, he implied to the committee that your contemporaneous notes on the January 3rd call, where you write that, you know, you noted that this is war, he implied that that was potentially fabricated after the fact. He told us, quote, one, I have no idea when this was prepared. I see it's written on the calendar date, so things like that. I don't know if this is something that may have been put together after the fact, just a little CYA, I don't know. Um, and he also said about that call that he missed, he writes, quote, I would later learn from those participating in the call that the briefing did not portray a high level of concern about violence toward law enforcement or threat to the Capitol, which of course you dispute. So I know there's a lot there. I wanna give yeah. you plenty of time to address each of these claims and basically tell us, are any of his points fair? Is he simply mistaken? Or do you think there's something nefarious here that he is intentionally lying to rewrite history in a way that paints him in a better light? So I'll start backwards. Um, in regards to the briefing, um, no, those were my talking points. Those were my talking points for that day written in my notebook. Um, and, uh, and I provided the select committee with a picture or like a photocopy of my notebook pages. They were not written after the fact. And to that, I would just say, he should have shown up for the briefing. It, he would have known it wasn't a CYA if he had actually attended the briefing. He did not. So that that's that. Um, regarding, you know, the the assessment and what was included in the assessment and target and qualifiers and all those things, you know, I think if you just look at it logically, you know, the intelligence assessment aside, in the first MAGA march in of that was November 14th, 2020. There were not all the states had called the election yet. So the people who were protesting and demonstrating still held out hope that the election could go for Trump because not all states had certified the election results yet. And then fast forward to December 12th of 2020, which was when the second MAGA march was, there were a lot of lawsuits going on. There was a lot of other things going on. And still people held out hope that Trump could still be elected and things would go a different way. But when you get to January 6th, the only target and the only focus, if you want to use those interchangeably, you can, like the only target and focus for those demonstrators had to be the members of Congress themselves, Congress in doing their congressional duty to certify the electoral counts. So I really didn't need to be the one to tell us on that. Like those were the things, those were like factual objective things. So it it had to have been Congress. I didn't need to say that for him to realize that. And then with regards to the team, you know, when I started and when I was hired and I started there in October of 2020, and in between the time I was hired and the time that I started, I did meet with my new supervisor and he told me, he said, the team really needs a complete overhaul. I had 11 analysts under me. Most of them had been there for 10 or more years. They had never received any formal intelligence training. So that was problematic. Um, they're very siloed. So they didn't communicate well within the Capitol Police and they didn't communicate nearly at all with other law enforcement agencies or with um, the intelligence community. And that was problematic. Um, and they were known to have and to produce very poor quality products. And I think that was some of what contributed to, to the failures that day was that, you know, our products were not taken very seriously because the team had a reputation of not producing good things. So for example, um, when I started, they had already written an assessment, an intelligence assessment about the, um, the presidential election. And there was an addendum to that, that assessment that focused on a left-leaning group in D.C., 
And I thought that was odd that that was where they would give special attention to, because it seemed to me pretty obvious that you know, Trump was going to lose and Biden was going to win. So a left-leaning group would not be upset over those election results. And so to focus on that and to not focus on any of the domestic right-leaning groups just seemed odd to me. So that's an example of where like their priorities were not really clear. They didn't know what they were necessarily doing. They didn't have the training to do it. They weren't very good at collecting intelligence by their own admission. Um, I put something up on Twitter a few days ago, um, emails from some of those former employees that talked about how they didn't know how to collect intelligence through open source through open sources. So that said, like the change needed to happen. It had to happen. And we were in um, a very chaotic time in our country and especially within the Capitol Police. So I needed the change to happen sooner rather than later because I needed a functioning team and I inherited a team that was not functioning. So, you know, it was less than ideal that things had to be done so quickly. And it was less than ideal that it had to be done in such like a turbulent time, but they were changes that most definitely needed to be made. And ultimately, you know, of those 11 people, um, six of them I ended up terminating or otherwise pushing out. Um, and that's not, and I know that they say it's because they provided intelligence ahead of January 6th and I was retaliating against them. Truth is, and the emails show that they did not at all. And they were just um, not very good employees. And, and, you know, anyone who's worked in the federal government, to be terminated from the federal government, it takes like a special kind of bad. <laughs> it's not easy at all. And it, and it takes a tremendous amount of documentation and um, just due process and making sure that, you know, they're given the opportunity to improve because ultimately you want good, like good employees and you want to give them the tools to succeed and do well. And if you give them those opportunities and they either don't take them or they're still failing, then I have an obligation as an, a manager and to my country to get people in place who can support the mission. Great. I want to ask you about Stephen Sun, the man and his inner allegiances. Uh, you write that he called you a few months after January 6th, asking you, was there something I missed? So at some point, you two must have been on relatively friendly terms. In his book, he made equivalences between the words and actions of former President Trump and President Biden and Vice President Harris. So he suggests that President Biden giving a speech against fascism in Philadelphia with Marines flanking him was the same as President Trump using General Milley and other military leaders in his photo op after clearing out Black Lives Matter protests, protesters in Lafayette Square in front of St. John's Church, that famous incident. He writes that Trump calling for people to fight like hell on January 6th is equivalent to Kamala Harris saying um, about the social justice protests of the summer of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, quote, this is what she said, that he says is equivalent. They're not going to stop. They're not going to let up. And they should not. And we should not. Uh, Stephen Sun blames the media for, quote, blatantly ignoring and openly mocking Trump supporters over their concerns regarding a potentially fraudulent election, which he says, quote, only served to energize them. And in his book, he invokes the thoroughly debunked and dangerous conspiracy theory that January 6th writer Ray Epps, now charged by the D DOJ, was an FBI plant, quote, writing, um, wondering if there would be some validity, if there could be some validity to the claims of FBI informant participation. In his book, he also tells of a story where a group of marchers in MAGA 1 or MAGA 2 had hung a Trump banner over the wall above the north entrance to the Capitol Visitor Center, which apparently... A chief son, I don't know if you recall this incident, did not take down immediately. And an oversight staffer, he says, ultimately told him that he felt that we, as in Sund and, and the Capitol Police, were sympathetic toward Trump. And he writes, Mr. Sund, that this could not be further from the truth. Um, because the two of you have sort of, you know, in your books presented kind of differing views of what went on on January 6th and, mm -hmm. and who's to blame. Knowing what you know now and what you knew about the man from when you worked with him, and given all of these sort of indications where he's putting a sort of an equivalency between the left, the right, kind of saying it's everybody's fault for January 6th, do you believe mm -hmm. that Chief Sun was sympathetic to Trump or the views of the supporters that believed ultimately that the election was stolen? And can you tell us generally what you think about whether there were none, some, many in the Capitol Police ranks 
who shared those views and if it had any effect on the level of preparation or how aggressively police responded to the crowd. So I think he is sympathetic. I don't think I necessarily thought that at the time on January 6th, as you mentioned, like I had only met him a couple times. Um, I know in his book, he says that he came down to my office frequently. I recall one time that he came to my office. So it wasn't a regular thing. Um, I did meet with him my first week on the job. But other than that, like my interaction with him was professional and friendly, but not frequent. Um, so I had no, and I also had no reason to like think that he would not heed what I was telling him. So I trusted him too. And like I said, it was friendly and it was cordial. And even after January 6th, after he left and he called me, I initially thought, you know, he had good intentions in asking me and that he was sincere and wondering what he may have missed. And, um, but since then, you know, he has been very vocal uh, in criticizing me. And I, I can't help to feel like it's done in a way to um, distract from his own failures. Because at the end of the day, he was the leader of the Capitol Police. The Capitol Police was not prepared. Intelligence, he had the intelligence. Um, even if I wasn't there and didn't write an intelligence assessment, it was well known, like everywhere, that something was going to happen on January 6th, and he didn't prepare for that. And that's on him. That's not on me. Um, he did not prepare. He didn't have a adequate operational plan. Um, so I do think that it, it, he's not the victim and the hero here. Um, he very much had some significant failures in his leadership in the way he handled it. And he let down a lot of like really good officers, like officers who had to fight and and were har har harmed and who may not be officers anymore, either because they were injured so severely that day that they can't do their jobs or just that's not a place where they want to work anymore, understandably. And so he let a lot of people down in the force and he let a lot of people down in the United States. But, you know, fast forward to today, he has very strongly aligned himself with the far right. He's been on a lot of um, far right media. So one can't help but to think that perhaps he did have personal feelings that impeded his professional responsibilities. It wasn't known then, but he's made it very well known where he stands politically now. And to be honest, I think he's trying to position himself for a political appointment should Trump be reelected. Re and someone who has failed to that degree in leadership and in operations, he should not, he doesn't deserve another chance. That's wild to, to think. And so just to follow up to you, you know, you worked, of course, alongside many Capitol Police officers. I want to make clear, you know, a lot, so many of them, you know, defended, of course, the Capitol heroically with limited numbers. A lot of it, you know, uh, as Chief Sun says, all hands on deck. But as our reporting on the committee showed, uh, at, at the height of the insurrection, at most, it was at the 70 percent um, of officers. It was not 100 percent. Um and so they did what they could with the resources availed to them. A lot of heroes that day. But, you know, some people uh, think that there were, you know, some within Capitol Police ranks and police generally who found the crowd, at least in the lead up, right, sympathetic to their cause or maybe misjudged <laughs> how dangerous or violent they might be because of, you know, um, that the sort of allegiance either to, to President Trump or to those sorts of views. How was what was your experience? Do you feel that that were there some? Do you think there were none? What, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, there were definitely some who were sympathetic, and we saw that, and we saw you know several officers being demoted, officers you know who put on MAGA hats and like helped the insurrectionists, um, and who are very very vocal to this day about supporting um, supporting those the insurrectionists and. Um, are very critical of, you know, several people from the Capitol Police who remained there or, um, you know, were there after January 6th. So there definitely were officers who were sympathetic. Um, and there were either, you know, there were also some officers that never made the news that we know had sympathies with the far right. But I think they are the outliers rather than, you know, the norm. I think most of the officers were there and did their job and did their job very well. Do uh, some of did some of them like potentially let their guard down because they didn't think that 
they would be attacked by this group because they thought this group was sympathetic to officers. Yeah, maybe. Um, but I also think the officers didn't have the full picture of what was going to happen because they did not receive the intelligence assessment that that I wrote. Um, at the time, the way it was supposed to go, it was supposed to be sent up to my leadership, which I did. Um, and Sun did receive it. I have the email. I put it on Twitter that he acknowledges that he had uh, received the in, the assessment. And then it was supposed to go down to the officer's leadership. So the sergeants, lieutenants, captains, inspectors. And it was supposed to be briefed out at roll call. And that didn't happen in most instances. Some divisions got the briefing, but most of them did not. Um, and it was, it's important to know too, I could not just like email the officers at the time I did not have the authority, um, to send out an email to all the officers, but it wouldn't have mattered anyways, because the officers didn't have phones and they, they don't sit at desks, So they're not like reading emails all day. So even if it had been emailed out to them, they probably wouldn't have seen it. So the briefing at the roll call would have been really, really important for them, which they never got. I want to turn now to race and just to wrap up, button up some of the things that, that Chief Sund is claiming. He talks about uh, chatting with Congresswoman Maxine Waters in the lead up to January 6th. In a call, he says, quote, was highly unusual, repeatedly describing how upset and angry Congresswoman Waters sounded, leaving him, quote, bewildered by her line of questioning, including this question she had was what police were doing to prevent protesters from climbing on top of the Capitol. And he writes in italics, she's concerned about people climbing on the building as if to underscore how ludicrous the notion sounded. And he, he writes, where was this coming from? And then he also notes that she wanted to know, quote, if we consider the demographics of the groups applying for permits. And he says, I explained that we absolutely do not take into account demographics. So mm -hmm. at this point, Chief Sund uh, concedes that he knew that social media had indicated that a lot of these folks were coming armed. So my question to you, do you think he would have been as nonchalant if the warning on social media was that Black Lives Matter protesters were coming to D.C. armed? He writes that, quote, any suggestion that the U.S. Capitol Police treated groups differently based on demographics is false, as well as personally and professionally offensive to me, he says. So my question to you is, what do you think? Do you, would the thinking within Capitol Police be different if these plans for violence were coming from Black Lives Matter? And would the response itself have been more bloody, more fatal, if the faces in the crowd were Black and not, and didn't look like the fathers, mothers, aunts, and uncles of the very officers that they now were surprisingly attacking? Yeah, so I think he's splitting hairs a little bit, and I'll address that in a second. But to answer your immediate question, like, yes, I do think it would have been quite a different response if the protesters were black and brown skin, just, just be frank. And like, that's unfortunately the world that we live in. That's what we saw the previous summer. Um, and it, I think they would have prepared significantly differently than, than they did if they thought, um, it, if, it was, if it was a different group of people or different ethnicity or different racial makeup. And that's unfortunate that we live in a world like that. Um, and, and and that's part of the reason why, you know, domestic terrorism has really like flourished too, because we've let them flourish. Like there are people spreading hate. And in a lot of ways, um, certain types of hate are okay and they're accepted. And that's not right. And, you know, when we, a lot of politicians, Trump being one of them, but many others in Congress and at the state and local levels too, they've given these groups like white supremacists, anti-Semitic groups, this platform, and that um, lets them spread their voice and, and um, spread their hate. And hate like never solves problems. Like everyone deserves to feel safe in their communities. And when people in power, empower these groups, these fringe groups, and brings them into the mainstream, then that's not okay. And like that's and and we've seen that happen. And I think that's what happened ahead of January 6th. And I don't see um and I, I think just if it was a different a different um demographic makeup, they would have had a different reaction. But I think what Sund, back to what Sund was talking about, I think one of the things that he was talking about is like who do we give permits to? And the Capitol Police will give a permit to any group regardless of like their racial makeup or their beliefs and stuff. And they've given, you know, permits to white supremacist groups and, you know, everything in between. 
um, on all spectrums of the, the political spectrum. And so that's, but that's because that's protected under the First Amendment. Like they don't have a legal authority to deny those permits um, unless they have like serious concerns about safety or things like that. And so I think he's splitting here is a little bit like, oh, we would never do that. Well, you can't because that's illegal, but you can prepare for a war if you think a certain group is coming versus not. And I think that's what we had here is that they didn't prepare because they didn't think that white people were as dangerous as black people is what it comes down to. Um, so you were incredibly vulnerable in this book, Domestic Darkness, including, I don't want to give too much away, I want people to read it, but it, revealing your romantic relationship with uh, DC Police Lieutenant Shane, um, Shane Lamond, who you write was allegedly, quote, colluding with the enemy. Now, those are the allegations that the government has brought against him. And even as you imply, maybe using information that you were feeding him inadvertently, um, to tip off Enrique Tario, head of the Proud Boys, who is now serving 22 years in prison for his role on January 6th, and other right-wing extremists looking to overthrow the government. So I want to ask you, tell us about how that makes you feel. It, it, it sounds kind of ripped out of the pages of a spy novel, but of course, your book, Domestic Darkness, is nonfiction. This is real life, and this was your life. So how did it make you feel? Do you think you were being played, or was the romance real on his part? Why did you keep it quiet, quote unquote, quiet as you write? And as Lieutenant Lamont faces trial and years in prison, do you think he is guilty? Do you think he deserves leniency? And does it feel ironic in some maybe sad way that the, you know, acting head of intelligence could not ferret out the sort of potential enemy sometimes sleeping under your own roof? So give me, give me your thoughts on that. Oh, that's a load of question there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know when my publisher read the, that part of the book, which I had not put in the proposal, he's like, this is great. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, this was my life. And this is not like how I wanted things to play out. Um, like every time, like I get asked that question, like, was Shane using you? It's like such a hurtful question. And I don't mind, don't mind the question at all. Um, but like, because it just sends my head into like a tailspin like did he did he just use me did I like why didn't I recognize it like he seemed sincere but was he not and so like I don't know the answer to that question I mean he did seem sincere and we had fun together and like he was very charming and he seemed genuine and so um I don't know but do like knowing what I know now like would I have made different choices yeah I probably would um, and I knew he was talking to Tario. That wasn't like something weird because I knew Tario was an informant. He was an informant at a lot of different police departments and that was public knowledge. So that he was talking to Tario wasn't weird to me. I mean, could have I could I have asked more questions about like what they were talking about? I could have, but I also didn't think it was necessarily like my business. And so um, I didn't go too much into that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. And then as far as like his guilt or innocence, this, like, I'm very conflicted about it too, because I did like Shane, like I, 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 I valued his friendship. And, you know, even after we stopped seeing each other romantically, we remained friends and we remained friends until the day he was suspended um, from MPD. And he called me up and I'll let people read about that conversation in the book. Um, but that was the last time I spoke to him. And so, you know, I think he's going to try to argue that he was just doing his job. But there's three things that I think um, it's going to be harder for him to explain away. So one is, and this is in the indictment too, it's item 61. That is a reference to me, the Capitol Police person. But after January 6th, he asked for a list of um, people who had already been identified. And he asked me for that list. And uh, thank God I asked the FBI first if I could share the list, which they said yes. Um, so that was fortuitous. But so I shared it with him. And of course, I would have shared it with him because he was really the only person I worked with at MPD. Um, and so in that list was something that Tario was interesting, interested in. Um, he also tipped off Tario about his arrest. And that was that made, when I read that in the indictment, I was a little bit annoyed because Shane had told me that Tario was going to get arrested too. And he made it clear, like, don't tell anyone that. I was like, okay, 
but then he's communicating and telling Tario himself. So that was a little frustrating. And then the third thing is if that relationship between Tario and Shane were where it was actually like an informant officer relationship, then why are they using self-destructing messages on Telegram or elsewhere? It would be one thing if Tario had initiated those like self-destructive messages, but it's another thing if the officer is, because presumably you're having that relationship to gain information, to access information that could be used down the road for prosecutions. And if they're deleting all their messages, why? Like, what's the intent there? So those three things make me think that he is aware that he did something wrong, at, at least. I mean, I'll let the jury decide whether or not he's guilty, but um, that goes to intent there, and that's harder to explain away. Yeah, and let me make clear, uh, I want to commend you for sharing, you know, what is obviously very personal, and as you mentioned, is still sort of difficult for you to wrap your mind around and to talk about. I think that's a really positive feature about this book and your willingness to talk about everything under the sun. As I mentioned in our intro, sort of acknowledging failures, you know, defending yourself and defending your successes, but also acknowledging that more could be done and talking about, you know, this private relationship and how it made you feel. So I want to commend you, number one, for sharing that with readers and then also, of course, talking about it here today. And one last thing about that relationship that I want to ask, I was struck by how it came about in the first place, because I think to me it highlighted the unique pressures that women face in male-dominated professions. So at your first meeting, when you're among a group of mostly male officers, you write that quote, as I drank my beer, I put up with the usual actions of intoxicated men, then putting their arm around me, lewd comments and other actions that I could handle, but shouldn't have to. And you say about Shane at first, quote, I didn't want to go out with him, but I wanted him to like me and trust me. And that information in your field is valuable and that that information, and though I had stopped being the reason for your primary reason for your relationship as it progressed into the spring and summer of 2021, was initially why you went out with him against those sort of first in reservations. So tell me about how being a woman trying to get ahead in a field perhaps put you in a position where you didn't want to outright reject his advances. And what do you think? Do you see that as fair? Is that just par for the course? Is it something you're just used to in your field? Talk to me generally about the challenges you face as a woman in the intelligence community and in law enforcement. Yeah, I think that's a good question. So it's a male dominated field, both of them, intelligence and law enforcement. And I was there. And I think and I, I think I say something similar in the book, but, you know, men are seen as credible, like they can do things to lose that credibility, but their starting point is that they are credible. Women are initially seen as not having any credibility. So you have to like work twice as hard or like say what you're trying to say, you know, three, four, five times before someone listens to you. And so that's problematic. And so all the people around me too at the Capitol Police, just for context related to Shane, like they were all men. And like Shane was the center of like Washington law enforcement intelligence, like he was the person, like everyone went to him. He was the center of it all. And, you know, I had a supervisor, Jack Donahue, who came from the NYPD and started around the same time I did. And like, he had already known Shane. And um, like, I wasn't getting a lot of information from Jack. Um, and I couldn't, like, he was uh, like a roadblock for me to go elsewhere to get the information on my own. Like, he very much wanted to be, like, in charge and the holder of the information and disperser of the information. And so I had to, like, navigate my way around that world. And I had to do it. And I think if I had been a man, like, I would have been brought into the fold right away. But I wasn't. And so I had to, like, I don't know if uh, people hear me. Yeah, I, I think- uh, I had to do it differently. I had a different mention in the book. There were only three women there working with them. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, Julie, you're back. Go ahead. Or maybe not. Maybe we lost her a little bit there. Or- um, okay, now, can so, you... uh, now I think we can hear you fine, Julie. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, we have really bad weather here too. So um, yeah, so there were three women there. The other two were wives and I was the only woman there who was working with all these men. 
Um, and they were all law enforcement. And so, yeah, and they were all drunk and like, you know, so they get rowdy and that's fine. Um, but it's hard to be a woman in that world and like, and to have to put up with all of that. So, and yes, Shane asked me out like three times before I finally said yes. And I relented because I was like, okay, well, maybe if I have like that relationship with him, it will help me like get into the inner circle because I wasn't, I was very much on the outside. And I thought to be successful at the Capitol Police, like I needed to get in. Great, thank you so much for that. So let's look ahead. In the aftermath of January 6th, even Republicans were rallying around the idea that this was tragic, an unprecedented attack on our democracy, the first non-peaceful transfer of power in our history, as I like to put it. But feelings are different now. Supposedly mainstream members of the Republican party are saying, these were just tourists. Um, if Donald Trump is reelected, he says that he will pardon all of them. Speaker Mike Johnson says he wants to blur the faces of the rioters in footage so that they can't be prosecuted. And a whole one in four Americans, and this is all Americans, not just Republicans. So 25% of all Americans believe the FBI instigated January 6th. So I want to ask you, are you hopeful or are you pessimistic the further that we get away from January 6th? What's at stake here in this next election, in the next few years? What do you think the legacy of January 6th and the investigation surrounding it will turn out to be? Will it remain a critical moment in our history worth study and scrutiny? Or do you unfortunately think it's bound to be forgotten and maybe even might happen again if Trump is to lose the election and claim again that it was stolen and that his people should rise up in arms? Okay, well, I think the blurring of the pictures is funny because I thought it was all Antifa who was there, so... I don't know why they need to blur their faces. Um, but anyways, yeah, I do worry about the future. I don't think we're going to have necessarily another January 6th, at least not at the Capitol. I think the Capitol Police know they're going to be prepared for that threat because they know that threat now. But I do really worry about it. I don't think long term um, people will forget about this. This is going to be something that will be studied and looked at and examined for years to come. And I do get frustrated. I see on social media now, like people are like, why are we still talking about this? Like, because the threat still exists. Like it is still a threat to our democracy. And we may have a re rematch now of Trump and Biden again, and it's going to be na nasty and it's going to be messy. And I hope that we learn the lessons that we need to learn from this. But I do think that we're in a dark period and I think we're going to have to go through some more darkness before we finally start to see the light. I think it'll come. I think there are enough good people in the government and in this country to see justice prevail and to um, maybe put us back on the right track. But right now, it's 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 not good. And it's unfortunate because it comes down to like people just need to use common sense and be realistic. Like let's let's call January 6th what it is. It was not Taurus. It was not a peaceful protest. Republicans know that they were running. They were running. And now like all of a sudden it's not like they just need to they just need to speak the truth. And if they don't, history will not look favorably upon them and I feel strongly about that. Great. I have a final question that maybe we can try to sneak in here. Um, I want to talk about, of course, domestic terrorism, which, uh, you know, a lot of your book is about the lead up to January 6th, your role in it, but then also looking forward at, you know, the threat that still exists in this country. Um, so there was a New York Times article about how these groups, the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, have sort of been quiet on a national stage, but have diverted resources to local politics, like in Loudoun County, where the Proud Boys disrupted school board meetings, shouting down elected officials with threats of violence and targeting their families over supposed critical race theory in schools. Um, and I understand mm -hmm. it. You're running for a seat on the Arlington County Board. So you yes, might be involved true. in local politics yourself. So um, if that's the next stage of the fight. Tell me. Um, about whether these groups are in hiding, are they regrouping, are they preparing for even greater violence next time around? What is the forecast on what they're planning next? Should we, we, should we be worried? And why do you think running for public office yourself is the right choice to help defend this country and its democracy from these people who would rather see it destroyed? Yeah, I think they're changing tactics. They haven't gone away. Um, some of the groups have changed, like Oath Keepers is kind of like defunct now, but in the structure of Proud Boys has changed a little bit. 
white supremacist groups we do see like really growing and flourishing, unfortunately. So their tactics are changing. And I talk about in the book too, some of these white supremacist groups are doing these like community um, benefits, like they're cleaning up trash and having, you know, feeding the homeless. And so they're trying to make themselves more palatable to the general public and then bringing people in that way. And I talk about too, like some of the tactics, like some of the foreign terrorist organizations use like Al-Qaeda. And it's like gradual, like incremental steps towards hate. Because if you just go in and say, you, I want you to be a suicide bomber, like that's going to turn a lot of people off. They're like, yeah, I'm not ready to go there yet. But if you do a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, then before you know it, you're in the thick of it. And that's the tactic a lot of these groups are taking. And simultaneously, they're also trying to make themselves more palatable um, to be able to run for local office and get into local office that way. And then with that comes, you know, um, changing curriculum and banning books and things like that, that are really like, that's really detrimental, like the lack of education or changing education in a way that denies like acknowledgement of injustices that have happened here in this country that's very, very dangerous because then it creates ignorance and then ignorance leads to hate. Hate leads to violence. It's just a ro road that we don't want to go down. Um, and that's part of the reason why, like bigger picture, why I wanted to run. Like I wanted, I'm running as a moderate Democrat and I really believe in like using common sense and listening to people and being practical and that being like the best way to help the community and to impart positive change in the community because we see how divided we are. I mean, we see how divided we are as a country, but also here in Arlington, Virginia, we're quite divided as well and divided over different things, but very divided. And like seeing that and seeing people going further right and further left and like staking their claim and like no one wanting to um, come together and find common ground and like move forward together in a positive way. That's really scary. And it's really like frustrating for me. So rather than complaining about it on social media, <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm going to throw my hat into the ring and, and I'm running for office. Great. So um, a lot of what you said, I think, is sort of a through line between your book and mine. It obviously is fiction, um, but it is it has, I hope, something to say about political violence and was shaped by my time both on the January 6th committee and in Congress uh, for four years right out of graduating from college. Um, you know, it's a murder mystery set in the Senate. So it is about um, political political violence and unfortunately how that's become more normalized. And um, mm -hmm. the fear that I have, just as you have, about um, those forces um, becoming stronger and not being attended to. So I know it's important that we sound the alarm and that our authorities, our law enforcement, look into that growing uh, dangerous threat um, from political actors who would be violent. So um, with that, I want to thank you so much for answering my questions. I know, of course, I know you have a little bit of a reading that you want to give us about your book. And then I do believe we'll be able to turn to questions and we have a hard stop at 415. But uh, after the reading, we can get to that. Thank you. And I just want to give a little plug. You are part of a podcast about January 6th that just came out. Do you want to tell people a little bit about that? Oh, quickly, yes. It's Our Body Politic. It's six episodes. It looks into the investigators of color who were working on the January 6th committee. Um, so check that out on Our Body Politic, wherever you guys listen to your podcasts. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to read just a, a couple paragraphs. Um, so the scene unfolding before me was heartbreaking on many levels. Not only was there the pain of seeing my colleagues being attacked with vicious animosity, but I was also watching an exquisite, sacred, grand building being destroyed. What it represented, freedom, democracy, in the center of the most powerful nation in the world, was even grander. The officers called for backup, but there weren't enough police, police in the city to hold back the crowds. The insurrectionists were ready for battle. The Capitol Police were not. The bike racks surrounding the Capitol to try to keep the people away from the building were being lifted and thrown over the outnumbered officers. They were no match for the mob. We've lost the line. I watched as the windows of the Capitol were smashed and the doors kicked. I was now viewing live stream video on social media that was being taken by the insurrectionists themselves. The pictures were unsteady and chaotic. It was sometimes difficult to see what was happening. 
but it was easy to see the bedlam, the fury, the fighting. The insurrectionists shouted, USA, and other patriotic rallying cries. They also made statements against members of Congress, Vice President Pence, and others that were spit out of their mouths with a ferociousness that represented a clear lust for blood. When it was clear the Capitol had been breached, Stephen Sun left the command center and retreated to his office. Chad Thomas, the assistant chief for uniformed operations, also left. The Capitol was defeated, and so it seemed were they. But the officers under their command kept battling. They had no choice. They couldn't go into an office and close the door on the whole situation. It was fight or die for the officers. All of them fought, some of them died. So we've got some uh, questions coming through in the chat. Jocelyn says, uh, it feels scary that if Trump wins, things can get really bad. As a Jew and queer and Earth-centric uh, about ecology, it feels like pre-Nazi Germany is possible. Is this kind of thinking ridiculous? I don't think it's ridiculous at all. And thank you, Jocelyn, for the question. I don't think it's ridiculous at all. As I mentioned before, these politicians, particularly Trump, has really taken these like fringe elements of our society and he's brought them into the mainstream and he um, views them as a legitimate voting block and courts their votes. And that's really, um, I do worry very much about what things would be like, what things may be like if he's reelected. So I think you're right to think it's 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 scary, but then it's up to us like to make sure that we vote for people who um, adhere to our values and also um, support candidates that are going to do the right thing and they're going to protect our democracy and fight for what is right and what is best for our communities. Hillary comments, why don't we call, quote unquote, radical right? I, I have no problem calling them the radical right. <laughs> like, there are. And it's, and, you know, there's a distinction there, though, right? There's a the far right. And there are people that are election deniers, they support hate, um, those, and that is the radical right. But we also have like legitimate Republicans. I have Republican friends and they're good people and they're trying to do the right thing. It's unfortunate that their voices are being overshadowed by other people in their party that are saying all sorts of you know crazy things and things that are not helpful for Congress. Lauren comments. Julie, were you located, where were you located during the January 6th vote counting and in the run-up to the insurrection that day and then during it? Were you in your office at the Capitol? So I was at the Capitol Police headquarters, which is on the Capitol complex. So if you haven't been there, there's the Capitol building. But then there's a lot of other buildings on the Capitol complex. So there's, you know, three Senate buildings, three House buildings, three library buildings, and then a few other buildings, one being the Capitol Police headquarters, which is next to the Dirksen, Dirksen Senate office building. So that is where I was. I was at the Capitol Police headquarters, which is about two blocks or so from the Capitol. I was in my office, which was on the sixth floor. I did spend a little bit of time that morning in the command center, which was directly above my office. Um, looking at what was going on there. But most of my time was spent in the office, um, just you know, a block or so away from the Capitol. And as we're coming up to the top of the hour, I wanted to maybe ask one final question and to the both of you. Uh, as we come up to this next election, uh, if you were to have the ear of our politicians in Washington and if you were to offer them advice from the ground, what would you both say just from everything that you have kind of absorbed in your experience? I'd say talk to your colleagues, because I think right now we have a dysfunctional government, like we have a dysfunctional Congress. Congress is not doing their job. They're not doing their job on many, many, many different levels. And so I want to see a functional congressional body. And so I think it starts with like talking to each other and and trying to find common ground and trying to pass legislation that matters 
And we don't see a lot of that now. We see a lot of like bickering back and forth and hearings for like political gain and things that aren't helpful. So that would be my advice. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about maybe the media. I, I um, have sort of early beginnings in media through high school, college, and then working a little bit for the Miami Herald this summer. Um, so I'm always very skeptical about blaming the media. I feel like it's an easy sort of way for both sides to just say either the media is you know, biased one way, it's biased the other way. I think Donald Trump attacked the media in ways that were um, very problematic for our institutions, because if you don't trust the media to give us our facts, people People will turn to their own facts, will turn to alternative sources that um, aren't, you know, don't have the same journalistic ethos that places like the New York Times and the Washington Post have. Um, it's important that we trust in the media and we don't down talk it. So when I say this, it's more of a friendly suggestion as opposed to a real criticism. But I do think, uh, I think because the majority of media folks are liberal, they're worried about um, coming off biased. And so they tend to do a little bit of a false equivalency between what's going on on the left, what's going on on the right. They feel like they have to give equal time. And we saw that in 2016, where they felt like they had to put forward uh, Donald Trump's rallies, where if he, you know, ran off so many lies all in one string and one order, there wasn't enough time to get to debunking all of them. And so a lot of it filtered through to the American public. And as we're approaching a second election where, you know, one of the leading candidates for president doesn't believe in fact, doesn't believe in truth, has already telegraphed, even before people have voted, that if he loses, it's going to be a stolen election and it will be unfair. And that, again, people need to, um, you know, rise up and 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 oppose um, his his uh, potential loss at an election that hasn't even occurred. Um, I think the media needs to really be clear eyed and focused about that talk being a threat about when he talks about immigrants poisoning the bloodstream to say that those are words that were used in very ugly circumstances in the early 19th century that led to very terrible consequences. Um, and so you can't just present it either as a joke or as both sides say harmful things. There is, of course, a far left, but the true, I think, uh, problem, danger, threat to this country are very, very far right by led by Donald Trump that are espousing violence and that are espousing hate. And so I think the media has to do a very a focused job of communicating that to the American people. And can I just add to Robin's thing too? The difference between the right and the left, the far right and the far left is that the far right is very organized. And there's a lot of organized groups there that are doing things specifically to undermine our elections and, and our in our country. And you don't really see that necessarily on the far left. They're not quite as organized. They're, you know, they're just not as organized, but they're very organized, well-organized and also well-funded uh, far right groups. Yeah, it's something for us all to think about. Uh, we are now at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Julie Farnham, for your courage, Thank your you. service to the nation and for sending out the warning call. And, and thank you also, uh, Robin Piguero, for doing the honors today and for your service. And also want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us. We have posted links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase copies of this fine book, Domestic Darkness. Um, Mr. Piguero also has a book coming out soon called One in the Chamber. We hope to feature him in our series for that. So keep an eye peeled. And uh, also I posted a pre-sale link for that book in the chat as well. Uh, if you find yourself in the neighborhood, come on down, visit us. Um, we are one of the country's great browsing experiences. We are located in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Tonight's program has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through our public events, a publishing program, and our educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So, so long, everyone. Take care. Be strong. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you once again, both. Thank you. Thank you so much.